Avalanche saw the Dubs put a good old fashioned take you behind the woodshed beat down on LeBron and the Lakers. It was garbage time for the entire fourth quarter as the Warriors were up by a stunning 30 entering the final frame. The shocking not mere momentum but personality shift of the field within this series was fueled by first and foremost Steve Kerr's coaching adjustments to play Steph more on the ball leading to Rajon Rondo-esque dime droppings one after the next. Instead of letting Vando track him down through off-ball screens, Steph being the primary ball handler on the majority of his buckets generated the Dubs significantly more offensive flow. Klay Thompson was locked in, posting his sixth career playoff game ever with at least eight triples. Another adjustment from Kerr was having Draymond guard Anthony Davis, and the increased warrior physicality overall evidently bothered the brow. The fourth quarter probably gave Steve Kerr some time to think about the potential adjustments that'll be made from opposing rookie head coach for the Lakers in Darvin Ham. Nevertheless, there was a clear statement made by the Warriors in the second half. Stay tuned to see the surprising X factor in the Dubs starting lineup, how the Warriors free agent pickups from last summer came through, and much more. Before that, just 12% of my audience is subscribed, so if you haven't already, please subscribe. Also, splash thumbs up for the YouTube algorithm, and follow at Hoops on Instagram and Twitter. Rajon Curry was dicing up the Lakers' defense with nasty assists one after the next, finding seams whether it was in transition, out of typically advanced Kerr-bred half-court flowing motion, or as the pick-and-roll ball handler. Brian Windhorst implying Steph wasn't in the same class as LeBron James before this one evidently motivated him to make adjustments as Steph displayed some of the usual quarterback passing that Braun has and continues to make a name off in this one. Curry had eight first half dimes, the most in a half for him all playoffs, and tied for the most assists in a half throughout his entire playoff career. We went over how Steph was getting blocked around the bucket by the likes of LeBron and Davis in Game 1, noting that some of his takes to the basket were inadvertent. However, in Game 2, the chef responded by picking his spots much more effectively, not going up with it too soon, and clearly making it a point of emphasis to get his teammates open looks as much as possible. Meanwhile, in the opening half at least, it was LeBron hitting threes like the chef, just like the chef was dropping dimes like LeBron. The first two baskets for James were three-pointers, one of which was in Steph's face, and later on in the second quarter, he collected it near the end of the shot clock and drained one of the toughest fadeaway prayers I've ever seen not just him make, but anyone make. However, James was a game worst, minus 27 in this one, and was outled by Wardell Stephen Curry II, whereas the opposite was the case in game one. Also in opposition to Game 1, Anthony Davis was really terrible as he combined with LeBron to get outscored by the Warriors by 49 points when the top duo graced the court. That said, the Lakers were staying in it early as D'Lo drained all of a fadeaway on the baseline, a fadeaway from the post, and a shake and bake midi from his sweet spot in the lane after working off a screen. It was a really solid night for both D'Lo and Hachimura as D'Angelo had a very loud 10 points and 8 dimes, while Rui was money from deep, hitting 4 of his 6 triples and finishing with 21 points off the bench. Of course, the Lakers need much more productivity from their role players, along with a night and day better showing from AD. But considering James, Hachimura, and D'Lo combined for 54 points and 11 assists, yet Darvin Ham's squad still found themselves getting clapped by 27 when the final buzzer sounded, you have to be a bit concerned if you're a Laker fan. Plus, LeBron was 6 of 8 from the field in the first quarter alone, in what was a Lebronto-esque 12 minutes to open this game. Yet, the Warriors sustained their flow throughout that surge from James, catapulting their lead in the second to 11 by the half, and ultimately blowing this thing wide open, clearly motivated out of the locker room by Steve Kerr in quarter number three. Therefore, we'd see a completely unforeseen 
lineup from LA to start the fourth, consisting of Max Christie, Tristan Thompson, Malik Beasley, Troy Brown, and Lonnie Walker. It was a decent call from Ham to save Davis and James, among others, of their stamina and avoid the risk of an injury in the fourth. That said, in spite of that, the Dubs maintained their 30-point advantage and now take every bit of momentum six hours down south of the road. San Francisco to Los Angeles. The Lake Show will have a day to regroup and get their mindset right, obviously knowing they did their job by stealing home court advantage. This series was hyped up as a LeBron versus Steph matchup, but in game one, it was AD leading the way, posting the first 30-point, 20-rebound playoff game since Shaq. And in this game two outing, it was Klay Thompson having the biggest impact, at least in the scoring department. Of course, watching Steph and LeBron try to one-up each other both in the leadership and offensive creation departments has been thrilling, but it's going to come down to the consistency of not just their individual two-way production, but how the pieces around them maintain their edge as well. The reason despite the Lakers taking home court advantage, I just said that the Warriors had taken every bit of momentum heading into Saturday's Game 3 at Crypto is because the defending champs closed out Game 1 exceptionally well despite taking the L. They went on a critically undermentioned in my last game breakdown 14-0 spurt in the last bit of the fourth quarter of that game back on Tuesday, and since that momentum evidently carried into Game 2, I'm curious to see how this momentum gained from the Warriors will translate into Game 3. But the story of this one was how Klay Thompson was making impossible threes for anyone not named Klay or Steph at least, draining off-balance daggers one after the next that were breaking the hearts of Laker fans all game. But you can't forget, this is Clay's self-proclaimed biggest stage, as before this series, playing against his dad Michael Thompson's Lakers, the team he grew up rooting for, Clay said that he'd been waiting 12 years for this moment to face the Lakers in the postseason. In Game 2, he certainly delivered. Thompson's eight deep-range bombs led to not just a 30-piece, but those triples were the driving factor for the Warriors tying a franchise record for single-game threes. The coaching adjustments from Game 1 from Kerr consisted of not just running Steph off the ball as much as possible, or putting Draymond on Anthony Davis, as previously mentioned. Those factors certainly will be noted in my film room breakdown of this game tomorrow. However, it was also replacing the under-the-weather Kavon Looney with Jermichael Green in the starting five that paid off, and in addition to that, the Dubs' offense consisted of a lot more backdoor cuts and give-and-go actions than usual, which will also be looked at tomorrow in the film room. But for Jermichael Green, this man finally showed up with that unorthodox, tough-to-time-up release of his. Green had scored just 23 points combined in the Warriors' first eight playoff games leading into Game 2, but would light it up by his standards for 15 points in Game 2, coming through with pressure-relieving daggers from mostly the corner. Not only was it Jermichael who showed up after not playing well for a while when the Warriors need it most, but another free agent pickup from last summer in Dante DiVincenzo also came through. Dante had a game-shaping reverse lay-in and three-pointer in the early going, and finished as a game second best off the bench of plus eight. How can you forget about Moses Moody, who hit an off-the-dribble triple in LeBron's grill? That was another critical early bucket to establish the dub's lead. Andrew Wiggins hit some big shots from distance also, and would finish as a mind-boggling plus 35, which was a team high in plus minus. Much better overall energy from A. Wiggs in this one. That same point about energy can also be attributed to Draymond's effort in this one. Dray came one assist shy of tallying a triple-double. Green also passed Rick Barry for the third most all-time points in Warrior playoff history. So while it was a Steph barrage in terms of dime dropping, an offensive adjustment clinic in terms of Steve Kerr's coaching, a flamethrowing masterpiece in terms of Clay's production, the role players showing up for the dubs,
made this a beautifully executed team effort as the Warriors prepare their next mindset and game plan with Game 3 looming. Again, I'll preview my film room breakdown on my favorite sets, general buckets, and stops from this Game 2 dubs blowout win for tomorrow. Subscribe for that film room. Thanks for joining the Deep Flow Hoops team here on YouTube, and peace.